Hey friends, in this video, I'll be looking at the original underdog story, David versus Goliath, and break down some facts and maybe even change your perspective on the entire meaning behind the legend. And hey, if you're new here, welcome to the party. I'm attorney Kyle Newman, and on this channel, I'm here with tips and insights for accident victims. And as a plaintiff's injury attorney for you know regular, ordinary people, this is what we do every day. We take on Goliaths in court and hold them accountable. And thankfully, the justice system allows us to do that and win. And since this is YouTube, let's shock that algorithm by slamming the subscribe button and hitting that bell so you get notified of our next video. I've been you know, regularly posting videos now for about five months on this channel, and the feedback has been awesome. You know, We're growing every day, and look, who knows what this turns into. All I know is I'm super proud of it and the information that we put out, especially when I get to engage with people like you. So don't be shy. Leave a like, leave a comment, you know, leave your best David and Goliath story. I would love to hear it and get back to you. So first up, let's take a look at the actual story of David and Goliath, which actually comes from the book of Samuel in the Old Testament, where these two men were engaged in single combat, which was essentially where one warrior from each side would fight each other to the death and the winner declares the ultimate victory. And as it went, the Philistines sent out their mightiest warrior described as really one of the most terrifying and intimidating people you could possibly imagine. I mean, his name in Latin literally translates to a giant. And at six foot nine inches tall, he would have been really big for today's standards, but in biblical times, this was absolutely gargantuan. And when Goliath rolls up to the fight, he is decked out head to toe in this thick bronze armor, arm plates, leg plates, massive chest plate, huge helmet on his gigantic head. And in each hand, he's got equally huge weapons. He's got a sword, he's got a javelin. I mean, this dude was legit. And then there was David, a poor shepherd who next to Goliath really looked like a little kid. And, you know, talk about armor. Nope, David left that at home along with his sheep. He wore the same clothes he got out of bed with. No armor, no shield, no helmet, no sword, no javelin. Just a sling made from two pieces of rope and a patch of leather. And to be fair, at first glance, this contest isn't even close. Goliath would crush David like a bug. He's got all the advantages you'd want out of a warrior representing you in death combat one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, he's got the size, the strength, the training. Whereas this Israelite, David, has none of those things. He's not a warrior. He was a shepherd. This was like the underdog going against the undertaker. And David has no shot in hell of beating him. But we all know the story. David killed the giant with a single shot from his sling, he was able to do the impossible against all odds, right? A miracle, it was a miracle. Well, not exactly. What if I told you that David's defeat of Goliath was actually the expected outcome? That even before this fight took place, Goliath was destined to lose. So I told you there's three things about this story that give David a massive advantage over Goliath that I bet you never thought of. So here it is. Fun fact number one, Goliath couldn't actually see David. And no, this wasn't an invisibility cloak. It wasn't a mythical golden eagle flying down and catching a ray of sun, blinding Goliath just in time. Goliath had bad vision. Well, Kyle, what proof do you got? You're a lawyer, show us the evidence. Well, remember, the Old Testament was not based on fairy tales. It was set in a world with at least some real events and real people. The Philistines were real. The Israelites were real. David and Goliath were real people with real families. Hell, back then it was real to settle these battles by single combat. I mean, oh, you've all seen the movie Troy. All right, back to the point. Goliath wasn't some mythical giant like in Jack and the Beanstalk. He was a man. And 5,000 years ago, if you stood six foot nine inches tall, which by today's standards is like eight and a half feet tall, there would need to be a medical reason to explain that abnormally huge growth. And guess what? There is. You see, someone of Goliath's size who came from a family of brothers who were similarly massive people suggests that he suffered from a rare genetic disorder called acromegaly. 
or more commonly known as gigantism. Now this is really important. Acromegaly causes tumors to grow in the pituitary gland, which is located inside our head next to our optic nerve. And when nerves get compressed, say by a tumor growing too big next to it, that causes damage to the nerve. And when you damage the optic nerve, you're going to have seeing problems, specifically with something called nearsightedness, which blurs a person's vision at distances away instead of close up. And lo and behold, the Old Testament quotes Goliath just before the fight saying, quote, come to me that I might feed your flesh to the birds of the heavens. Come to me? Why? Take two steps, dude, and slice him in half. Why would Goliath ever tell David to come to him? Because he couldn't see him. And while Goliath is expecting David to do what every other warrior has ever done in the past, fight hand to hand in close proximity, that ain't happening here because David ain't no warrior and he ain't no dummy either. And here's the first lesson I get or my first takeaway from this. The advantage of being the underdog, this idea of a David in the fight, is that the Goliaths out there tend to believe that their perceived advantages, their size, their power, their strength, is always going to be enough. It's always gonna be enough to get them over the finish line, no matter what, even though the truth may be that they're facing even greater disadvantages, which because of this, they're never going to see coming. And why I wanted to do this video is because this has been really the story of my career. I was always the youngest attorney on trial. I'd go up against these big shot partners at defense firms with their gray hair and their condescending attitudes and their five assistants trailing them into court. And they just look at me and just for the fact that I was 20, 30 years younger than them and far less experienced and tried all of my cases on my own, they thought that they could beat me in their sleep. You know, I'll be able to work less because there's no shot that this kid could ever beat me. But they let their guard down. And for someone who over 14 years, maybe close to 100 verdicts, has lost two cases, I can tell you firsthand, being the underdog is the absolute best place to be because they will let their guard down and never expect a real challenge. The second part of this story is that Goliath is actually powerless. At first glance, Goliath is a giant. He's this massive being, he's outfitted head to toe, heavy bronze armor, weapons in both hands. The guy's a killing machine. And then there's David. David wears no armor, carries no conventional weaponry. All he's got is this slingshot. Why? Because David realizes that heavy armor would weigh him down. And yes, Goliath could easily kill David with his sword or his spear or his freaking bare hands, but only if David were foolish enough to walk right up to Goliath, which of course, that's the last thing that David plans to do. This does something that is so crucial when taking on these Goliaths. It levels the playing field. If you go up against a Goliath, if you fight on their terms, you are doomed. But if you have them play on your terms, then all that perceived advantage, it evaporates into thin air and they are left extremely vulnerable. The final misconception about this story is that David goes into battle with what amounts to be a children's play toy, this slingshot. However, that's not what David has at all. Instead, he's carrying a sling, which is a simple but highly effective weapon that's used by armies in battle as well as shepherds like David to protect their flocks from wild animals. And when you look at this weapon, you can see why it's so deadly. A sling has a leather pouch with two long cords attached to it and a projectile, either a heavy rock or a lead ball. This is not a children's toy. In fact, it's an incredibly devastating weapon, which if you calculate the ballistics on it, actually has the stopping power of a 45 handgun. So when David lines up, he has every intention and every expectation of being able to hit Goliath right at his most vulnerable spot between the eyes like he's done a thousand times on the bullseye back home on the farm. And that's exactly what David does. He walks right up to Goliath yet still far enough away so that his sword and his spear are totally useless and he kills Goliath with a single shot to the head. And then like a total gangster, 
He apparently cuts off his head and shows it to the crowd like this painting here. So it's late here at the office. I'm wrapping this up. Let's take a good look at this story and look at what we've learned. The lesson here isn't simply that when a powerful competitor takes on a smaller one, the smaller one might by some miracle win. No, it's that an advantage to one can be a huge disadvantage to the other, that you should never ever underestimate your adversary, especially when they're an underdog. There's just something about it. I'm telling you, it's my favorite thing in the world. All right, folks, that's a wrap. Thanks for letting me get biblical up in here and shake up one of my favorite stories ever, which is something I really think about as an attorney all the time and something I'm super proud to be, which is an underdog. All right, I'm out of here and I'll catch you on the next one.